What a fine day. You know, I just, I, I tried to explain to you about the way that I think that people ought to eat. And I bet a few people were thinking, that's too difficult to live on a diet of starches, vegetables, and fruit. That's too difficult. Well, a couple of days ago, I was on an airplane. And the lady in front of me asked for a seatbelt extender. Now, that's difficult. <laughs> Getting your breast amputated, that's difficult. Having your chest exposed to stale operating room air with bypass surgery, that's difficult. Taking so many blood pressure pills that you become impotent, that's difficult. Eating oatmeal and going for a walk is easy. <laughs> I take the easy way out, honestly. I mean, I, I watch what people go through and I say, why do you, why do you make it so difficult when, when it can be so easy to enjoy good health, to feel good every day? But part of the problem that people have is that they have been misinformed. And so what I'd like to talk to you about is about five dietary myths that keep people fat and sick. And until you get over these misunderstandings, it'll be hard to change your diet. You'll be frightened. You'll think you'll be malnourished by eating a diet based on starches, vegetables, and fruits. So let's get into the five dietary myths and find out what the truth really is. The first myth is starches make me fat. Now, we're going to talk about that in great detail, and I'm going to explain to you the importance of starches and how really they make you thin. But people get confused, don't they? They say starches make you fat. Why would they say that? Remember, you look around the world and you see people who live on starch-based diets like the Asians are trim. Maybe it's because of the thing people put on starches, like uh, bacon bits and sour cream and butter and oil in their spaghetti sauce. Maybe that's why starches are considered to make you fat. But as we'll discuss in great detail, you'll understand the starches really make you thin. So let's go on to myth number two for now. Myth number two is I need meat for protein. I even have dietitians that believe in this. Now, I don't think they've read a dietetic book in years, but they'll tell you that. I need meat to get protein. Well, how do we debunk this myth? Well, first of all, we have to realize that there's protein in plants. How do we figure that? Well, there's enough protein in plants to build our biggest animals, hippopotamuses, giraffes, elephants, horses, cows. If you can grow those big animals with their great protein needs, you ought to be able to grow a puny little human being, don't you think? Yeah. Well, the scientific research really lays it out for us. Experiments done in the late 1940s, early 1950s on men and women showed really what we needed in terms of protein. If you take all of your calories, that's 100% of the calories you eat in the day, and you divide it into calories that come from protein, calories that come from carbohydrate, calories that come from fat, only 2.5% of your calories have to come from protein to meet all of your protein needs. Only 2.5% of the calories. Now, the World Health Organization, they took this information and they made a recommendation in 1974 that still stands today. They took the experimental findings that say you need 2.5% of your calories as protein, and they doubled them to make a definitely safe level. They didn't want anybody left out. Anybody that got malaria, broken bones, anybody that got a serious infection, they wanted to cover everybody. So they have recommended since 1974 that 5% of your calories come from protein. Now, let's take a look at some of the foods that I would recommend to you. Rice, 8% protein. Potatoes, 11%. Corn, 12%. Spaghetti, 14 Oatmeal, 15 Bread, 16 Beans, peas, and lentils, 26 to 28% protein. It's impossible to design a protein-deficient diet based on whole vegetable foods. You can't do it. No scientist can do it. No dietitian can do it for a very simple reason. Nature designed her foods complete long before they hit the dinner table. Had to be that way. If it wasn't that way, you would have some type of sensory mechanism so that you went out and searched out these high-protein foods. But the truth is, if you get enough of starches and vegetables to eat, you get satisfied. What is the greatest time of growth in a human being's life? They're a baby, right? They, they double in size the first two years of life. And what's the ideal food for a baby? Humans, that's right, mother's breast milk. Mother's breast milk 
is 5% protein. At a time in life when you're doubling in size, your ideal diet is 5% protein. At a time in life when you shouldn't be doubling in size, and <laughs> <laughs> but many people are, <clears throat> Instead, your diet could be rice at 8%, spaghetti at 14 or beans, peas, and lentils at 26 to 28% protein. Easily, plant foods supply all of your protein needs. Now, once you get past that understanding, your misunderstanding, that myth, then the next thing you might ask yourself is, uh, is the protein complete? Does it have all of the essential amino acids that I need for proper growth? Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. There are 20 amino acids that build all the proteins in nature. They build all the proteins in nature by rearranging a different sequence. Just like you build all the words in a dictionary by taking 26 letters and rearranging them in a different sequence. You make all the proteins for elm trees, mosquitoes, hippopotamuses, and people with the same 20 amino acids rearranged in a different sequence. Of those 20 amino acids, we can make 12. So we call those non-essential, unessential, we make them out of the basic materials of sulfur, nitrogen, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. They don't have to be in the food. They're unessential. But of the 20 amino acids, we have to have eight of them in our foods. So we call those essential amino acids, and they are tryptophan, phenylalanine, leucine, isoleucine, lysine, valine, methionine, and threonine. Experiments were done in the late 1940s, early 1950s, where they took people and they fed them synthetic diets. And what they did is they determined which of the amino acids were necessary, which were essential. And they got a clue from doing animal studies previously. And they determined these eight essential amino acids were necessary. And then what they did is they determined how much of each essential amino acid that a person required. And they did that by slowly removing one of the essential amino acids, until people could not synthesize the proteins properly in their body, they'd start spilling large protein fragments out of their body through the urine. And then they got the clue that that wasn't enough amino acid for proper synthesis of all the proteins. So that was set as the minimum amino acid requirement. And by the way, that was the maximum any subject required in the experiment. Then what they did is they took the minimum requirement, which is the maximum any subject required in the experiment, and the difference was great in the, in the subjects. They took that and they doubled it, and they made a definitely safe value, which they called the recommended amino acid requirement. And today, if you look in a dietetic handbook, what you find are these values, the minimum and the recommended. Now, if you take any single starch or vegetable, and you provide it in the calorie amount that's provided in these experiments, you will find that every single starch and vegetable meets the requirements for recommended, which is twice the minimum, which is the maximum any subject required in the experiment. It would have to be that way. I mean, why would our creator design a system where we have to go out and match our beans with our rice and not give us a drive to do that? There's no taste bud that tells you to do that or any sensory mechanism that tells you to do that. You go out, you eat enough potatoes, enough rice, and you're satisfied. Now, throughout history, it wasn't this scenario. It wasn't a scenario where the, the uh, person who secured food in the family would go out of the house and tell the, the homemaker, gee, I hope I find enough beans and rice for you and the kids today so we can get the complete amino acids. What was said is, I hope I have enough food so we don't starve again. And if that food was obtained, then the family members were sufficiently and properly nourished. The essential amino acids that we get <clears throat> are provided easily by plant foods, and our requirements for protein are likewise supplied easily by plant foods. Now, we require a certain amount of protein. And if we take in more than that amount of protein, the body has to dispense with it. The body has two mechanisms for dispensing with excess nutrients. When we eat, it takes the nutrients and utilizes the ones that we need, then it has to get rid of the excess by either storing the excess, as we do with fat, we easily store it here, or it dumps it out of the body. Now let's consider protein. According to the experiments, we need, say somebody my size needs 20 grams of protein a day. The World Health Organization says I need 38 grams of protein a day. What if I take in what the average American takes in, say 140 to 160 grams of protein a day? What happens to that extra protein? Do I store it? If I stored it, I'd stored it 
in my muscles. And if I stored all the protein that I ate from cows and pigs and chickens, and I took off my shirt and flexed my muscles, who would you be looking at? Arnold Schwarzenegger. You got it. You got it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save you the thrill <laughs> and me the embarrassment. Just remember forever that excess protein is not stored. Excess protein is excreted from the body. And in the process, it does some wear and tear on the body, actually causes disease. The liver and the kidneys are the primary organs for excreting excess protein. And so they enlarge, and they get overworked. And as a result, you can damage the liver and kidneys. And this is particularly important for people who have already suffered from liver and kidney damage. For example, people with diabetes that have kidney trouble or high blood pressure. And it's also important if you're going to treat somebody who has liver or kidney damage. People who have serious liver disease, if you put them on a low protein, particularly if it's vegetable protein, these people can be in a coma and wake up. People who have progressive kidney disease, if you put them on a low protein diet, you can slow or stop the progression of the kidney disease and keep them off a dialysis machine. It's a phenomenal treatment that was developed 100 years ago and it's still discussed month after month in the scientific literature, but all too seldom used. In addition to uh, wear and tear on the organs, there are other problems by taking in all this excess protein and all these excess amino acids. Amino acids. These are acids. And some of the acids are very powerful, particularly those that contain sulfur. Your sulfur-containing amino acids like methionine, what they do is they break down into sulfuric acid. And it delivers a very high acid load to the body. Now, the body has to deal with that acid. Now, let me mention to you, sulfuric acid is very high in certain products, the animal products in particular. As a matter of fact, if you compare beans, which have the same amount of protein as beef, there's five times as much methionine in beef, which is those, one of those sulfur-containing amino acids, as there is in beans. The body has to deal with that acid. And what it has to do is buffer it. And it has to buffer it by providing alkaline material. And the primary buffering system of the body is the bones. So the bones dissolve, and they release various alkaline substances which neutralize the acids. Now, this has to be done because the body's acid-base balance is protected precisely so that all the chemical reactions in the body can, can take place properly. You change that acid or base balance, and the whole system gets messed up. So the body works really hard to guard that acid-base balance. So we take in acid, the body dissolves the bones, releases alkaline material to neutralize those acids. The primary sources of acids are animal foods, hard cheeses, poultry like chicken or turkey, uh, meat, eggs, or shellfish or fish. These are the primary sources of acid, whereas vegetables and fruits are alkaline materials. Even citrus fruits that you think of as acid are really alkaline. So we acidify the body, and the bones dissolve. And the next thing that happens is this acidification and the high protein and the sulfur-containing amino acids, they go and affect the kidneys. And they cause the kidneys to excrete that bone material into the urinary system. And sometimes that bone material it solidifies into rock-hard bones, which are known as calcium-based kidney stones. Over 90% of kidney stones are based on calcium. Now you lose that bone material and you get a common problem, a greatly feared problem, something that's a household word these days, which is osteoporosis. Osteoporosis occurs commonly. In fact, over half the people over the age of 60 have evidence of osteoporosis. And the bones break. And the bones break when they get to be 50, 75 percent deteriorated. You cough and a rib breaks, or you go over a bumpy road and your backbone breaks, or you take a step and, a step and your hip shears off. It's a very frightening problem. Now, if what I tell you is true, that osteoporosis is a disease of animal product intake, then we ought to see it in the world picture. So we look around the world, and we plot hip fracture rate, which is the most common manifestation of osteoporosis, we plot that against animal protein intake. Country by country, we see this relationship. The higher the animal protein intake, the higher the incidence of hip fractures. You look at countries with low animal protein intake, like rural Africans or people in Pau Pau, New Guinea, who live on a near-vegetarian diet, hip fractures are rare to non-existent. 
They used to argue in the British literature that hip fractures did not occur in women in rural Africa. Not a single hip fracture. Now, of course, African-American women in this country have hip fractures commonly. You look at uh, Asians, like in Hong Kong, Singapore. They eat a little more animal protein, a little higher rate of hip fracture. You get up to Denmark, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand, the United States. They're eating lots of animal protein, and they have lots of hip fractures. But that's not what you hear, is it? No, what you hear is the problem is not enough calcium. So let's take a look at that the world picture. Let's plot hip fracture rate worldwide with calcium intake. And what we see is a similar straight line correlation. The more calcium consumed worldwide, the more hip fractures. Now, that, what that has to tell you is that the amount of calcium we eat has little or nothing to do with the strength of the bones. And that's what the truth is. Now, that's not necessarily what industry wants you to know. As a matter of fact, they want you to believe that taking all this calcium in the form of calcium pills and dairy products is good for you. But that's not what the scientific literature says. What the scientific literature says is that calcium has little or nothing to do with the strength of the bones. As a matter of fact, about 70% of the studies show that. About 30% show it does have something to do with the strength of the bones, but I have to tell you, a lot of those studies were paid for by the calcium industry. And a lot of those studies, a lot of those studies also are based upon calcium pills that show a positive influence of calcium. And you know how they work? Those calcium pills are alkaline materials. They're bases. Calcium citrate, calcium chloride, calcium hydroxide. These are bases, so you eat the calcium pills. Tums, for example, commonly recommended to keep your bones strong. What's Tums? An antacid. So you take the calcium pills, it neutralizes the acid from the meats and the hard cheeses. That's how it works. So industry, they want you to believe certain things. That makes sense. They want to be profitable. But I, I can't blame industry alone for this. I have to also say that we're partially responsible. You know, we don't want to hear that the way to have strong bones is uh, to limit turkey for Thanksgiving or fish for a special night out, do we? No, we want to hear the way to have strong bones is another piece of pizza or one more dish of ice cream. Isn't that right? Sure, we're guilty too. <clears throat> but that's not the truth, folks. Studies done which appear in the scientific literature in the 1980s. What they did in these studies is they looked at the calcium balance of individuals. Now, the calcium balance refers to the amount of calcium that goes into the body through the intestinal tract versus the amount of calcium that's lost through the urinary tract. The first column up there represents the initials of the principal investigator. The second column represents the calcium intake, and the third column and fourth column represent the calcium balance of low and high protein diets. What you see is on 500 milligrams of calcium a day, which is lower than it's recommended. Most recommendations are around 800 up to 1400 milligrams of calcium a day. On 500 milligrams of calcium a day, if you're on a low protein diet, which represents about 85 to 90 grams of protein a day, you're in positive balance. In other words, more stays in than goes out. And you see that from the first two experiments. But if you're on a high protein diet, which is around 140 to 150 grams of protein a day, you're in negative balance. Increase that calcium intake to 800 milligrams. Low protein diet, positive balance. High protein diet, negative balance. Now I'll go up to the highest recommendation that's given, and that's 1,400 milligrams of calcium a day. Low protein diet, positive balance. High protein diet, negative balance. And these are all the studies that have been published that have looked at this directly. So the truth is, no matter how many gallons of milk you drink, no matter how many handfuls of calcium pills you take, if you're going to be on a high-protein diet, you're going to be losing your bones. They'll be going out through your urinary system, into the toilet, and they're gone. An interesting story comes to us from National Geographic magazine. This was published in 1987. This is a story about two unfortunate women who 500 years ago were sitting in their hut, and an ice floe landed on top of their hut and froze them for 500 years. They discovered these women frozen in excellent condition for examination, and they did an autopsy on these women. They found them to be in their 20s and in their 40s. They also found that they showed signs of severe osteoporosis, and they also suffered from atherosclerosis. And they said in the article that this is probably the result of a heavy diet of whale and seal blubber. So even 500 years ago, 
this high animal protein diet was wiping the bones of Eskimos away. The Eskimo in 1974 was reported to have 15% greater deficit in bone compared to people in the United States. And that's eating a diet containing 2,500 milligrams of calcium a day from all those bones in the fish. That high protein diet wipes out the bone. It did 500 years ago, it did in 1974, and it does today. Myth number three, milk builds strong bones. What are we looking for in milk? Calcium, right? And where does calcium come from? Plants, greens, keep going. Calcium comes from the ground. That's where it comes from. That's the original source. All your minerals are in, in the ground. They're like little rocks, you know, iron, manganese, potassium, sodium, calcium. It's in the ground. And the way it gets into animals is this. It dissolves in watery solutions. It's taken up into the roots of plants, becomes incorporated in the roots, stems, flowers, leaves, and fruits of plants. And then the animals come and eat the plants. No animal eats ground, except for a two-year-old. <laughs> so what I would ask you to do is I'd ask you to get your calcium from a more direct source. Go to the plants. And if you do, you will always meet your calcium needs. How do I know that? Because dietary calcium deficiency has not been described in the world scientific literature. In other words, there are no cases of people who eat a low calcium diet who develop a disease called dietary calcium deficiency disease. It's just not reported. Oh, and you say osteoporosis. I just explained to you that the loss of this bone is not due to a deficiency of calcium. No. The loss of the bone is due to that high acid diet, due to the consumption of all these high acid foods, the hard cheeses, the poultries, the meats, the egg products. That's the culprit. Now, when we consume something that is supposed to be good for us and really isn't, we can get into some health problems. What I want to talk to you is about some of the health problems associated with consuming cow's milk to get our calcium. Now, first of all, everybody realizes that, I assume everybody does, certainly most of the people that are well-read, realize that consuming whole cow products, whole cow milk products is unhealthy. High fat, whole fat cow products, cow's milk products. You realize that that fat, which is 50% fat in whole milk, 70% fat in cheese, you realize that fat's not good for you. It makes you fat. It uh, encourages heart disease and strokes various kinds of cancers, diabetes. And so as a result, most good consumers have taken the fat out of the diet, out of the, out of the uh, dairy products, and now they're consuming low-fat or non-fat dairy products, like skim milk, cottage cheese. And they think they're eating health food. Let's examine that. Let's examine the consequences of consuming low-fat and non-fat dairy products, like skim milk non-fat cottage cheese, etc. The first clue that you would get that consuming these low-fat dairy products wasn't good for you is when you looked at the sugar that's in the dairy products. When you take the fat out of the dairy products, you're still left with milk sugar called lactose and cow milk protein and things associated with that protein. As a matter of fact, the relative amount is increased as you take the fat out. The milk sugar lactose should give you the first clue that you should not be consuming dairy products. Lactose is not digested well by over 70% of the world's population. They get diarrhea, stomach cramps, and gas. It's called lactose intolerance. It's due to a deficiency of an enzyme called lactase. Lactase is there to digest milk. So when you're a baby, you digest mother's milk, which is good. But after you get to be four or five years old, you're supposed to be off the breast. You have no need for milk, so the enzyme disappears. Well, when you answer the dairy industry's advertisements to drink milk for everybody at every age, then you don't have the enzyme. You can't digest it. As a result, it causes diarrhea, stomach cramps, and gas. I mean, just based on that, people should step away and say, why should I be consuming this? It makes no sense at all. But there's more to the story than that. The protein part of the milk 
Remember, there's lots of protein in non-fat dairy products. The protein part of milk is the number one cause of food allergy. Now, scientific research says somewhere around 11%, maybe a little less. I don't agree with that. I would say for the people that I see at my clinic at St. Helena Hospital that somewhere upwards around 50 to 60% of people, when they get off the dairy products, symptoms that I relate to cow's milk allergy disappear. But the problems that we know are caused by cow's milk allergy are snotty nose, ear infections, asthma, eczema, bedwetting problems. Can you imagine bedwetting problems caused by cow's milk? Well, let me tell you a story. About 10 years ago, Mary and I gave a talk in Beaver Creek, Colorado, to the Young Presidents Organization. Now, these are the movers and shakers in the world. To be a, a member of the Young Presidents Organization, you have to be the head of a company that makes more than $5 million, and you have to be 40 years of age or younger. So I was giving this talk on the principles of good health that I so believe in, and my host was the president of one of the biggest hotel chains in the country. And because he was my host, he had to sit there during the whole presentation. Now, his wife was sitting in the presentation voluntarily. She liked everything I had to say. But he was sitting there begrudgingly, to say the least. He hated everything I had to say. As a matter of fact, he took me out to dinner that night, because he had to as a host, and he proceeded to order a great big thick steak and three black label scotches and told me exactly right to my face what he thought of me. <laughs> well, his wife heard this story about bedwetting problems and cow's milk allergy. And I explained to her what happens. What happens is the child drinks the milk, and some children, the milk goes into the gut, passes through the gut wall easily into the bloodstream, and then it's filtered into the bladder and causes the bladder to swell like a giant hive. And then the children, because the bladder is swollen, can't feel the buildup of urine. So the kids go to bed at night, and the bladder fills up, and they can't feel the sensation that they need to get up and go to the bathroom. And the next thing they notice is just wet bed sheets. So I explained this to the man's, the man's wife, and she told me that she had a 9 and 11 year old who were faithfully going to the psychiatrist every month with their bedwetting problem, and everybody was feeling guilty about it. So she listened to my advice, and she went home and took the kids off the cow's milk. Now, the president of this hotel chain, he was a big man in many ways, and I got a letter from him six months later. It was an apology. He said, against my advice, my wife took our boys off the milk. And I want you to know they only wet their bed once in the last six months. And it was a night they stayed over at friend's house and they had ice cream. And I want to apologize. Yeah, he was a big man. So these are the minor allergies, okay? These are the things that are, are an irritant. But there are also some life-threatening immune reactions that occur. And these are called autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases. I, I don't know if you've ever been touched by this or heard about it, but if you have, you have likely been given the explanation that I got about autoimmune diseases when I went through medical school. Autoimmune disease is when the body attacks itself. And every time I heard that, every time I heard somebody say, well, autoimmune disease is caused by the body attacking itself, I'd go, stupid, why the body, stupid, why the body attacks itself? It doesn't make any sense. Well, I know now why the body attacks itself. Some of the autoimmune diseases that have been tied to cow's milk protein are rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, type 1 diabetes, nephritis, that means inflammation of the kidney tissues, and also arteritis, that's inflammation of the arteries. That's the inflammation of the arteries that is a process of atherosclerosis that hardens the arteries, that gives you heart attacks and strokes. The dairy protein is involved in that. So here you're trying to get your arteries clean. You're trying not to have a heart attack. You go to skim milk, which is good. You got the cholesterol and fat out, but it's not the best you can do. You've got to get that animal protein out because what happens is that animal protein reacts with the immune system and creates antibodies that attack your arteries. We know this because people with the rottenest arteries the most atherosclerosis have the highest levels of antibodies to cow milk protein in their bloodstream. So take that extra step if you're trying to prevent heart disease. But let's focus on autoimmune diseases by talking about type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is a, a tough disease. It's also called childhood diabetes because that's the most common kind of diabetes in children. 
but half the cases occur in people over the age of 19, so it's really not childhood only. It occurs in adults too. But when it occurs in a child, it's particularly tragic. It changes the family forever. One of the people who worked for me in the past presents an excellent example of what it can do to a family. I've known this man for almost seven years. I knew him before he was even married. And he became a close friend of mine. Then he got married. And I would talk to them on occasion. And I would uh, say to Nick, I'd say, Nick, uh, you're going to have kids someday. I want you to raise them right. I want you to feed them properly because it's really, really important. Particularly, I don't want you to give the kids milk because it causes lots of problems, including juvenile rheumatoid arthritis and type 1 diabetes. And Nick would say, yeah, yeah, and his wife would say, oh, yeah, sure, sure. We'll do that. Don't worry. Well, you know, the reality hit. They had the kids, and you know how kids are. I want this, I want that, and parents try to please. And so the kids got the cow's milk. Well, they had a three-year-old and a one-year-old at this time. And one January evening, the three-year-old girl became sick. And by Wednesday, she was so sick that she was at the hospital. And she was hospitalized with diabetic ketoacidosis, life-threatening condition. The parents were panicked. Nick met three doctors that night and asked the doctors, what causes this? Two said, I don't know. The third said, milk, milk. Well, needless to say, it changed the family's life. They can't go out anymore. They can't hire babysitters. They worry night and day about what the child eats and what the child's blood sugar is. Child controls the family based on the food and based on the child's sicknesses. Just the whole focus of the family is now on this child's diabetes. It hasn't made their lives better, from my perspective, to say the least. And even to this day, you know, it's hard for me to, to look at Nick and look him in the eye. And the reason is, I know you probably think because, because it's one of those I told you so kind of things. No, that's not it at all. The reason is, is because I look at Nick and I feel somehow I failed him. You know, somehow I, I didn't try hard enough. I didn't try to be forceful enough or convincing enough. I wasn't articulate enough. I, I didn't convince him with the importance of this enough. And I feel like I left, let his family down because their whole lives are changed because of this. Type 1 diabetes, that's where the pancreas, the cells that make the insulin in the pancreas are destroyed. And you have to take insulin the rest of your life. And it's usually a, a short, difficult life, too, because these people fall apart very quickly because they're now they're handicapped. And so they can't defend and repair as well. So they get an infection in their foot, and they could lose their leg. And they're fed the typical American diet usually, and that's a diet that kills people without diabetes, so they die of heart attacks, they go blind, they get kidney failure very quickly. They'd do better if they ate a better diet. And I always recommend type 1 diabetics eat a healthy diet because if you take really, really good care of them, patients with type 1 diabetes, they'll live long and fully functional. I've seen people with type 1 diabetes 40 years after diagnosis. The eyes working, the kidneys working, everything fine. Whereas they should have had a major complication within 11 to 17 years. 40 years. But these people were raised on a diet taught by Walter Kempner at Duke University, the rice diet. A diet of rice and vegetables. A little bit more austere than what I recommend, but certainly no more healthy than the diet I recommend. So people who are unfortunate to get this disease you know, life's not over. You've still got some choices to make, and you can still make a difference that allow you to function well and live well, and your children too. But let's talk about the evidence that says that cow's milk protein causes type 1 diabetes. The first thing that was noted was that around the world, when you compare the incidence of type 1 diabetes to cow's milk consumption, you have almost a straight line one-to-one -one correlation, one of the strongest correlations in medical epidemiology. Investigators took this information back to the laboratory and they set up experiments where they had laboratory animals consume cow's milk. And what happened is these laboratory animals developed antibodies to cow's milk that attacked not only the cow's milk but also the insulin producing cells of the pancreas and caused these animals to become diabetic. The classic study in people was published in July of 1992 in the New England Journal of Medicine. They looked at 150 children with type 1 diabetes. And they found that all of these children had high levels of cow's milk antibody in their bloodstream. And the antibody was not just directed to cow's milk, but to one spe specific protein on that cow's milk, in that cow's milk. 
And actually, it was directed to a segment of 17 amino acids in that cow milk protein. To those 17 amino acids, unfortunately, those 17 amino acids also are present on the surface of the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas. So this is how the story goes. The child drinks the milk, eats the cheese, the ice cream, etc. In susceptible children, these are children with a leaky gut, adults too, remember, we're not just talking about children, people with a leaky gut, the protein goes intact through the gut wall into the bloodstream. And now you have cow floating around in the bloodstream and the body says, hey, this is a foreign protein. This could be a virus or a bacteria. I can't let this continue. I must make an antibody against it like I would make an antibody against the protein coat of a bacteria or a virus. So it makes the antibody against the cow milk protein. And now that antibody floats around the bloodstream looking for those 17 amino acids. And unfortunately, it finds it on the insulin-producing cell of the pancreas. And it attaches and it destroys. And on the average, it takes five to seven years to destroy the pancreas. Now, how do you get a leaky gut? This doesn't happen to everybody that drinks milk or eats other cow, cow milk products. How do you get a leaky gut? Well, leaky guts are caused by eating the American diet. They're caused by toxins in the environment, environmental chemicals. They're caused by viruses. And they're also caused by consuming a, a medication that many Americans, if not most Americans, take. And that's non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These are the arthritis pain pills that people take, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, cause a leaky gut, which, by the way, can take as much as four months to repair after you stop the medication. So what we have is a situation where the body takes in this foreign protein. In some people, it gets into the bloodstream, and the body makes antibodies to it, and these antibodies end up attacking the body itself, trying to protect it from foreign proteins. And it causes all kinds of different diseases, like I mentioned. Rheumatoid arthritis, where they attack the joints. Lupus, where they attack the joints and skin. All kinds of different problems. So the way you solve the problem is you get the gut lining to be intact again by eating a good diet, staying off the medications. And what you can do is you can slow the progress of many of these diseases and actually reverse many of the disease problems. This process, by the way, is called molecular mimicry. Molecular mimicry, understand what that means. It's a copy of the protein the body's trying to attack. The copy is the human protein. You can look it up on the internet called molecular mimicry. Another problem with non-fat dairy products is that they cause iron deficiency anemia. The most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in young children called Heiner's syndrome is due to the consumption of cow's milk. It does it by several mechanisms. One is cow's milk products are deficient in iron. They have virtually no iron in them. The calcium and phosphorus in cow's milk will complex iron from other sources, like green beans or beef, and make it insoluble. So now that iron can't get in the body. And the cow's milk protein causes the gut to bleed. In children, this may represent uh, microscopic blood or grossly bloody diapers. And you cannot correct this anemia by giving iron or blood transfusions. The only way you can correct it is by stopping the cow's milk. Now, this is part of the mechanism that's involved in causing iron deficiency anemia in women, which 20% of women in their reproductive years have iron deficiency anemia, and this is part of it. Another serious problem with consuming these non-fat and also whole-fat dairy products has to do with infection. There are various organisms that infect animals that also infect us. They cross species barriers. Why do those organisms threaten us? It's because we're animals just like they are. And so various types of bacteria like E. coli, which caused the uh, jack-in-the-box uh, infection up in Seattle, which was life-threatening. Uh, salmonella, which has infected the uh, cow's milk on many occasions. Listeria, which you often find in cheese. And tuberculosis, which infected the cow's milk products in Hawaii when I lived there. Also, a couple of other interesting sources of infection are bovine leukemia and bovine AIDS viruses. These are a potential threat and a real threat to people. Why are they a threat to people? It's because our systems are so similar. Why should you not worry about plants? Because plant systems are so different from us. Plant systems are different, and as a result, their threats, their infections do not threaten us. You have no friends with Dutch elm disease. <laughs> None of your relatives have aphids. 
because the systems are so different. So when you're dealing with animal products, when you're dealing with animal products, you have to be concerned. Now you say, oh no, I heard, I heard about vegetable products being a source of infection. Yeah, okay. Like the, the Adwala apple juice. Well, that's because the apples fell and landed in the cow dung. And that's how they got the E. coli. Or you say, how about the strawberries? They're infected with hepatitis A virus. Well, that's because human waste got on the strawberries. That's not because strawberries get infected with hepatitis A. Let's go back to these two viruses. This is, this is kind of interesting. We have a situation in this country where over 60% of the dairy herds are infected with bovine AIDS and or bovine leukemia viruses. And they're usually infected with both. That essentially means 100% of the dairy products are infected, close to 100% are infected with these viruses because they mix the milk together in vats. Now, how do these uh, herds get infected? Well, it's from various, reason, various reasons. You remember up until recently, part of the animal food was ground up animals, called offal. They also use the uh, same dehorning instruments. They use the same needles to give injections. They feed the baby cow's pool colostrum, and in that way they share these viruses. Now, why do I consider this a, an important concern? Well, we know that these viruses are easily transmitted among species of animals. You can feed this cow milk infected, uh, these, these viruses, and these, the cow milk is infected with viruses. You can feed it to goats, sheep, and chimpanzees, and they get easily infected, and they get sick. We know worldwide and nationwide the incidence of leukemia parallels the consumption of cow's milk. And we know that both of these viruses have infected human beings. Now, have we proved that leukemia is due to cow's milk consumption? No. But it certainly is of concern. And you're so concerned about the possibility of viruses causing leukemia that you take your kitty cat to the veterinarian to get a feline leukemia virus and va vaccination. So it's a possibility, and it's a strong possibility, and one that I would sure be concerned about before I poured my child a tall, cool glass of virus. <laughs> now, I'm going to risk my credibility with you. Okay, I'm going to suggest to you that cow's milk contributes to osteoporosis. Oh, he's gone too far this time. <laughs> Well, let's consider this. You, you are, are wise consumers, and you love to be sold at a high level, I'm sure. I, I bet that you were influenced like I was by the advertisements from Crest Toothpaste. What they did is they took one group of kids, and they, they brushed them with Crest, a fluoridated toothpaste. They compared them with another group that didn't get brushing with a fluoridated toothpaste. And those that brushed with Crest got 47% fewer cavities. Intelligent scientific information to the consumer that's how we want to be sold. Why not do it with dairy products? Why not take one group of women and feed them dairy products and compare what happens to their bones to another group of women that don't get the dairy? Makes sense, doesn't it? Well, that experiment has only been done once, and it will never be done again. It was paid for by the dairy industry, published in February of 1985 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They took postmenopausal women because they're most likely to get osteoporosis. And I would guess they fed them non-fat dairy products because they didn't want them to die of heart disease before the experiment was over. And they compared them to a group that didn't get the supplement. These are the results. Those who got the milk were consuming close to 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day, the highest recommendation ever given. Those consuming the milk were still in negative calcium balance. In other words, they lost more calcium from their urine than they absorbed from their gut. And if you look at the charts carefully, you'll see that those consuming the milk lost twice as much bone as those that didn't get the supplement. And the authors, Ricker and Haney, took credit for it. In the paper, they say that in their lab, they've studied this, and they've found that animal protein causes the loss of calcium. And when you consume three eight-ounce glasses of skim milk a day, which they gave these women, you increase the protein content by 30%, which negated any benefit from the calcium. They will never do that experiment again, but I wouldn't buy until they do and show you directly that these products work. All the evidence is circumstantial. 
Myth number four, chicken is low cholesterol food only if your chicken is made of the same elements as my alligator is at low cholesterol. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of these products. This is the cholesterol content found in three and a half ounces of various muscles. Beef is 85 milligrams of cholesterol, lamb 82, pork 90, veal 88 milligrams, skinned white chicken 85 milligrams of cholesterol, turkey 83 milligrams, mackerel 75, another fish perch 150 milligrams of cholesterol. What does this tell you? It tells you a muscle is a muscle is a muscle. Whether it wiggles a tail, flaps a wing, moves a limb, or closes a shell. And if you're going to switch among various muscles, then you're going to end up taking essentially the same amount of cholesterol in. There have been four studies published in the scientific literature where they compare the results of the consumption of various kinds of muscles, of meats. And they find when you switch from red muscle to white muscle that the cholesterol content of the person's blood remains essentially the same. Why wouldn't it? There's a game that they play on Sesame Street that starts out with this rhyme. It says, one of these things is not like the others. One of these things just doesn't belong. Now, you've got four choices here, and one is different. Can you tell which are the same and which is different? Well, I want to tell you, folks, until you figure out which are the same and which is different, you will stay the same. Myth number five, vegetable oil is health food. Now, this is one we're going to talk a lot about as we go on in this series. But let me introduce some of the issues. Besides the fact that vegetable oil tastes bad, I mean, I really couldn't get anybody to drink a cup of olive oil or safflower oil or corn oil. I mean, it just it wouldn't be appealing at all. Why do they put oil in food? You know, if it doesn't taste good, why do they put it in the food? It acts as a vehicle to get things that do taste good to stick to the food. Like, for example, the oil gets the salt to stick to the french fries and potato chips and the sugar to stick to the donuts and the spice to stick to the salad leaves. Well, what if you could figure out a way to get the salt, sugar, and spice on the food without the oil? And that's really a very simple thing to do, as you will see. You will learn that vegetable oil is the strongest promoter of cancer that we commonly come in contact with. We'll talk about how vegetable oil damages the arteries just as severely as animal fat. That's right. When you compare, as they did in a study published out of uh, UCLA, where they looked at men who had two angiograms, and they looked at what they ate. Those who ate vegetable oils had the same progression of artery disease as those who stayed on the animal fats. The only people that showed slowing or regression of their artery disease were those that lowered either or both of those fats in their diet, so their total fat intake decreased. Now you say to me, okay, but I know, I know different. I know that people who eat vegetable oils have less heart attacks. Well, that's true, they do but not because the disease of the arteries doesn't continue at the same rate of progression. It does. But it's because these vegetable fats, they thin the blood. So you're less, li less likely to form the clot that finally finishes off the artery that supplies the heart or the brain, which gives you a stroke. So you thin the blood. Well, that may be good to prevent heart attacks, but what happens if you get in a car accident or you have a weak artery that bursts? That's right you could have a greater chance of having a hemorrhagic stroke or bleeding to death. So it can be a real downside. Now, the other thing about vegetable oils that we've discovered through experiments is they are stronger promoters of gallbladder disease than animal fat is. And there's something I want to talk to you about in terms of the destiny of oils and fats, but particularly vegetable oils as our discussion goes here. For one thing, as we're going to discuss in great detail, Vegetable oils, like animal fats, are worn. The body stores them in their fat cells. And I want to make that one thing absolutely clear, and that is olive fat is no more attractively worn than cow pig or chicken fat. It's all disgusting. <laughs> now, in addition to these oils, these, quote, health food vegetable oils being stuck under your skin, they also end up on your skin. You take your dog to the veterinarian. And you ask the veterinarian, how do I make my dog's coat shiny? What does he tell you to do? I put vegetable oil in the food, lard, eggs, right? Yeah. Well, folks, on a dog, a shiny coat is attractive. <laughs> but on people, greasy hair and greasy skin is disgusting. I know this. There's a product that's actually sold to men to take the shine off their forehead. 
So if you're tired of shining like your dog, <laughs> just follow the advice opposite that given by the veterinarian. And you'll have a smooth, clear, pink complexion in just a matter of days. I'm absolutely amazed at what happens to my patients in a matter of around four or five days. The change is dramatic when they change their diet. Now let's think about this from a little bit of a philosophical point of view. I mean, would our creator make a faulty design in its highest creation, the human being? I don't think so. I mean, would our creator develop a system where we have to risk our life with heart disease and strokes and cancer to get a necessary nutrient known as calcium by consuming dairy products? What a silly way to design a human being and its environment. doesn't make any, any sense at all. When it comes to uh, amino acids, you hear you have to go out and you have to mix and match your, your, your beans and your rice to get essential amino acids so you don't end up becoming deficient. You've got to have a dietitian follow you around or a dietetic handbook in your back pocket so that you don't get amino acid deficiency and die of some horrible disease that you, by the way, have never seen. No, our creator would not do that. Our creator designed us with this hunger and supplied the foods that are complete so that when we eat them, we're satisfied with the nutrients that we need. And is it possible that somehow vegetable oils that are in the foods naturally and safe, they're in an environment of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and all the other plant chemicals that make them safe and effective, is it possible by taking those oils out, and remember, all free oils are processed, is it possible by taking those oils out and putting them in a bottle, they become healthier for you? I don't think so. I think the way things were designed initially are the right way things should be, the correct way. And I think if we always look back upon that, upon the whole picture, upon the fact that it has to be proper, it has to be correct, and our interference usually makes things very wrong, if we look at it that way, we can figure this whole thing out and understand that a plant-based diet with some exercise and some clean habits will give us the health and appearance that we all deserve. Thank you very much.